Well, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kieran Kirk. I'm the Dean of the College of Science at the Australian National University in Canberra, and welcome to day two of our, um, of our symposium. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all of the lands from where the participants of this meeting are zooming in from, from right across the country. I'm in Canberra. I'm here on the beautiful lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples were the nation's first scientists and they remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land. We pay our respects to elders past and present. We had a wonderful day yesterday. It started with that brilliant conversation between Sharon Lewin and Tony Fauci to start the day and then a very thought provoking series of sessions that covered a whole range of topics. Unfortunately, we lost streaming for the last 15 minutes of the session with Nick Watts and Fran Baum. Uh, fortunately, our streaming partners, Fivestream, have recorded the session and they have pulled out the bit that was missed. So this part that was missed from yesterday will play during the break that is scheduled from 12.40 today. It'll be starting to play from about 12.45. So apologies for that, but you do have the opportunity to see that today. Before I introduce our first session, just a few housekeeping issues. The full program with speaker biographies is available on the live stream page that you're watching now or via the Academy's website under events. Please do use our meeting hashtag for social media posts, hashtag AAHMS2021. On the right hand side of the video display on your screen, you will see a Slido box where you can type in questions to the presenters and the panelists in the sessions today, and you can write any comments. And we encourage you to use this. Please do engage with the panels, with the chairs and everyone else using the chat box as much as you like. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce the chair of the first session for today. Dr. Susanna Elliott, who will be chairing the session on impact of scientists in the media. Dr. Elliott is the CEO of the Australian Science Media Centre. The Australian Science Media Centre is an independent, not-for-profit, that works with the news media to inject more evidence-based science into public discourse. Susanna has a PhD in cell biology from Macquarie University, a graduate diploma in journalism from the University of Technology in Sydney. She has an honorary doctorate in science communication from the University of Adelaide. Susanna has more than 25 years of real experience in science communication with the interface between science and the media being her primary focus. Susanna is a board member of the Environment Institute at the University of Adelaide. She is a member of the Inspiring South Australia steering group she is a judge for the Banksia Sustainability Awards, and she's a regular contributor to ABC Radio National's Drives program with Patricia Cavellos. Susanna, it is now my very great pleasure to hand over to you. Thank you so much, Kieran. And I uh, just want to say that um, I'm speaking to you from the uh, land, uh, lands of the uh, Ghana people. Um, they're the people of the Adelaide region. So um, what are we talking about today? So we're talking about the impact of scientists in the media. And I really have to say that I cannot think of a time in my lifetime, and certainly in the, in the 16 years of the, of the Australian Science Media Centre's history, where science has been so prominent in the media. And that's really saying something because we've, you know, we've dealt with issues such as tsunamis and you know, the Fukushima, uh, disaster in Japan. We've dealt with so many major, major issues and this tops everything by a long, long way. So um, I, we're going to talk a bit about uh, the impact of, of scientists in the media today and there's, there's just so much to talk about that, you know, we probably won't fit everything into this session. We'll try and get as many of your questions in as we possibly can. Um, I guess just to get the ball rolling, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we've noticed. Um, we did a report with monitoring company Stream in about June last year and found that beyond politicians and public servants, it was epidemiologists and immunologists who had the highest impact, the highest number of media hits, if you like. Um, and that has continued. Um, and now we're seeing a lot of other types of experts as well. And it's been interesting in a sense, there's also been, um, you know, quite a gender, um, you know, Good gender mix. You know, we've seen people like Catherine Bennett, Mary Louise McClaws, Rhina McIntyre, um, Julie Leask, lots of people who 
Um, you know, we wouldn't have normally thought of as household names, but now we're seeing them on, on our television screens almost every day and they're becoming very well known. And of course, with such exposure comes costs, some comes personal costs as well. And that is something that, that we'd like to talk a bit about today too. Um, and it's not just the media that's been utilising scientists, of course. The politicians have been using scientists a lot during this pandemic, almost like human shields in some ways. I mean, how often have we heard the refrain, we're just following the medical and scientific advice. Um, so it's clear that scientists have played an incredibly prominent role in both the political and media landscapes. So um, before we go any further, I shall introduce our esteemed panel. So um, we have today with us, Professor Tony Cunningham, who is the director of the Center for Virus Research at Westmead Institute of Medical Research. Uh, Tony is an infectious diseases physician, a clinical virologist and scientist, internationally renowned, renowned for his research on the immunobiology of HIV and herpes virus, and his work on vaccines, uh, vaccine development and, as an antivirals expert. He's uh, the director of the centre, as I just said, and in 2010, he was awarded Officer of the Order of Australia for Services to Medicine, particularly in the field of viral research and through the development and leadership of medical and biomedical research. We also have Professor Julie Leask, who is Professor, of Sydney, uh, professor at Sydney Nursing School in the Faculty of Medicine. And uh, she's also a visiting fellow in the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance. Um, Julie's a, a social scientist, incredibly important field for us, specialising in immunisation. And uh, she's at the University of Sydney's uh, Susan Wachill Wa Wa School for Nursing and Midwifery. Um, she also has a Master of Public Health and Nursing um, and Midwifery. She's a visiting fellow and she is also chairs the WHO Behavioural and Social Drivers of Vaccination Working Group. In 2019, Julie, Julie won the Australian Financial Review's 100 Women of Influence Award, which is quite something. Then we have Professor Joan Leach, who uh, many of you will know from the Australian National Centre for the Public Awareness of Science, also known as CPAS, and that's based at the Australian National University. Um, she uh, has research and teaching centres on the theories of the public and science communication. Um, language and rhetoric and science, both in public and in technical context, and the challenges of ethics and science communication. So her whole area is extremely relevant to what we're talking about today. Uh, Tegan Taylor is an ABC science journalist, and many people will have heard Tegan on Coronacast, along with uh, Norman Swan. Um, she's the health and science reporter at the ABC and um, the Coronacast series has won uh, multiple awards, including the Walkley Award and the Eureka Prize for Science Journalism and has been a kind of mainstay, I think, for a lot of people getting information um, about coronavirus and vaccines, incredibly important role. So that's our wonderful panel. Um, I'm now going to kick things off with the first question and please do type your question into the Q&A box and we'll try and get to as many of them as we can. So first of all, I wanna to throw to the panel, how important is the role of scientists in the media or has the role of scientists in the media been since the pandemic started and how has, has this role changed over time? So can I throw first of all to you, Julie? Thanks, Susanna, and I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Darug country and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Uh, of course, we're going to say that science has been vital because um, of who we are and, and, and what our endeavours are. Um, we've needed independent expertise. We've needed good matches to topics. We've needed people who can help the community make sense of what's happening and synthesize knowledge um, and package it up. And uh, I think what's been interesting for me as a public health person is to see the way the population has learned population health thinking. And that's happened through having people with public health training, um, mostly they're being called epidemiologists who are um, providing commentary and helping the public to understand what's going on. 
and also to ask critical independent questions if they can. And often that's um, required um, having occasional back channels to people who know a lot but can't speak as easily to make sure that there's a good understanding of why policies happen in the way they do and to be able to also disentangle where health advice and politics sometimes um, meet. Uh, and, and, and I think so not just the expertise and the public health expertise in particular, along with all the other um, science, um, relevant science expertise like vaccinology, immunology, et cetera, but vi virology, but just having that expertise available has been so, so important. And we are so privileged in Australia to have a rich array of experts available to us. And they're here because of investments in science in the past. And it shows government that those investments need to continue if we're going to have those people available to do that sense making, to provide that ad advice to policymakers in the future with future crises. Terrific, thank you, Julie. Um, now, Tegan, you obviously have utilised experts a lot. How do you see the impact of uh, scientists in, in the media over the last 20 months? Yeah, I think it's been interesting. I'm a specialist journalist, so I've been talking to science scientists as part of my job since I started doing that job. Uh, but I think for the general mainstream news media, and um, I think it's also important to talk about things that aren't just news as we as we know it, but also social media, because that's where a lot of people get their news from, is that there's been a really huge expansion. And I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about the pitfalls of this, but I do think it's worth mentioning just how much of an expansion there's been in just general knowledge of science and health, that health literacy over the past uh, yeah 20 months, if we're counting, has been really huge. And then I think about the sorts of people that newsrooms were scrambling at the beginning of the pandemic to figure out who was the right person to approach to ask about these things. And it was a new disease, so no one had kind of existing expertise to draw on. And I remember mentioning in passing to someone in the newsroom that I was talking to an epidemiologist, this is back in like February last year, and they were like, oh, that's so interesting. I never even knew that was a thing before. Whereas now everyone's an epidemiologist, for better or worse. So I do think um, the... Scientists in the public eye and health scientists in the public eye, I think, have a much, much higher profile than they ever did before, which I think is a good thing. Great. Um, and look, um, before I go to you, Tony and Joan, I might just throw this first question in because it's very relevant to the discussion of what uh, Tegan was just saying, actually. Um, so Ross Koppel asks, um, he said, well, he's a comment really in a way. I've been concerned about scientists putting themselves forward as epidemiological experts when they have no background in viral infections or pandemics. Uh, does the panel share this concern? Tony. Yeah, uh, firstly, I'd like to endorse what uh, Julie said, and I think Tony Fauci emphasized this, that uh, these pandemics come along infrequently and politicians and the public forget about them. So it's really important to ensure that we get investment uh, in the science that underpins the uh, capacity to respond to uh, pandemics. And I don't think we do that well enough yet in Australia compared with the UK. So there is a real opportunity for us to showcase science and research. What I noticed over uh, two years, a bit similar to what the Nolan report from the University of Canberra emphasised, and that is a sense of real unity in 2020 uh, and in 2021 more fragmentation, uh, particularly uh, state, commonwealth, etc. In, in back to politics as usual. How did that influence us? Uh, I found that uh, in 2020 I was spending a lot of time explaining uh, things about the virus, about uh, uh, about vaccines and particularly RNA vaccines that no one had ever encountered before, uh, at least in the common media. And also to note what Chris Blythe said yesterday, and that was that to explain to the public the evolution of scientific knowledge 
and the scientific process, which means that, um, as Tony Fauci once said himself, aerosols were thought not to be important until those studies in battleships and others that emphasize that aerosols are important inside and that masks can uh, reduce uh, the issues. In the second year, uh, we've had again um, uh, the need to work with journalists to explain why there may be differences in some of the literature coming out. For instance, even in the duration of immunity, which is currently a huge topic, the papers coming out of Israel, Qatar and the UK differ. And so it's, it's, we, we're needed as experts to try and help uh, disentangled some of that data, which is often just simply put up on the uh, websites as um, uh, as uh, preprints and not uh, peer reviewed. And to address Ross Koppel's question, uh, I, I certainly have tried to stick within my expertise, which is vaccines. It's it's reasonably broad in vaccines, but uh, I think when uh, uh, there are plenty of experts around on uh, rapid antigen tests and uh, antivirals that I then refer uh, people to. Thank you, Tony. Joan. So this is really interesting. I mean, um, I absolutely want to agree with the notion that, you know, um, uh, that we need, you know, continued investment in science. But I, I think I'd also throw out that we need continued investment in social science and interdisciplinary approaches to how we're going to work together <laughs> to solve some of these major issues that are coming out of um, out of the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. And and I know, you know, Julie has been really front and center uh, on this. Everybody wants to be in public health now, uh, and that's such a radical change. I mean, just thinking back to twenty nineteen, I was involved in a big project with public health. Uh, colleagues who felt very beleaguered, um, ignored um, amongst the, the um, medical and scientific establishment, and now they've kind of been um, uh, pushed, to, pushed to the forefront. But, but I think it is that combination of both social science and science that is going to really um, help here. Uh, you know, political scientists, there have been political theorists who say, we could have predicted this was going to happen. <laughs> Nobody asked us. And it's that siloization, right, of seeing science as outside society that kind of makes us have these conversations that go in circles. Uh, and so one of the things I think, well, two of the things, we've learned a lot about how science works. It's kind of been um, science unfolding in public. Uh, so we see scientists disagree. And I think in a very positive way, we've seen people give their reasons for their disagreement. Um, you know, about whether masks or no masks. Or, and that is just, it's unusual. It doesn't happen. Uh, you know, in the media, it's usually about breakthroughs, science already finished, uh, what might happen way in the future. But this is actually science as it's unfolding. And I, I actually think that's one of the positive um, aspects of this. But we've also learned a lot about the media, right? So, you know, the Rethian mandate that, um, you know, public oriented media is supposed to educate, inform, and entertain. Uh, researchers usually run to the inform and educate. And people are still, even during a pandem pandemic, coming for entertainment and for stimulation and for distraction. So learning more about how science works in public has been a really interesting thing to watch happen and I think a positive thing. Um, and also learning a little bit more about how um, mediation works. We talk about the media, but you know, media is such a broad category. We're working, we've learned a lot about that too. Excellent. Um, Look, as a, an issue that a couple of you have touched on, and you know, I, I don't expect that everybody's necessarily going to agree on this because it will definitely depend on where you're coming from. But um, as the um, as the pandemic has become more political in a way, um, and there has been this change in the science and understanding of the science, and therefore some confusion around things like mask wearing. Um, do you feel that scientists should be attempting to sing from the same hymn sheet or um, so as not to confuse the public? Or do you think that the independence, <coughs> excuse me, the independence of scientists and the difference of opinion is an important part of the discussion? Tegan. I've got some thoughts about this. Um, I think that th there's a really nice idea that we should all be, or we, I'm not part of um, uh, the science community, but that there should be consistency, but that's, 
if that's not authentic, if that's not, uh, it, you have to be speaking with integrity. And the truth is, I think that it feels perhaps a little patronising to think that the scientists, you know, if, as a member of the public, the scientists are all kind of getting their story straight before they come out to the media. I think that just fuels this, um, that, that part of the community that feels like there's stuff that they're not telling us and that there's cover-ups and that sort of thing, which um, I know uh, I'm sure we'll talk about trolling later and that's been some of the content of that, including stuff that I've received as well. Um, the public, uh, I mean, we're talking about mass media, we're talking to adults. They need to be able to be empowered to do their own, inform themselves and come to their own decisions. And um, even if everyone gets it right in the way they're trying to explain things, there will still be people who will interpret it a misinterpret it, I mean. So I think for a scientist, and this is me projecting, I'm not speaking from that community, your integrity and your um, understanding of your field is more important, I think, than trying to find some kind of perhaps sometimes false uh, unity. Right. Does anybody else um, on the panel want to make a comment? Julie. Yeah, I, I want to get to the pointy end of this. This is really difficult, this dilemma, because I, I, I'm i for um, commentary that's helpful to people that doesn't create unnecessary anxiety, and there's been a lot of fodder for anxiety about risk. And with vaccination, that played out in January and February as uh, a bunch of people deciding that the AstraZeneca vaccine was inadequate for Australia, it wasn't effective enough, based on trial results, which we know are not the end of the story if we work in vaccination. And that the, 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 a whole lot of people rounding, including doctors, saying this vaccine isn't good enough for us, um, and statements from learned societies was very unhelpful for vaccine confidence. And yes, the vaccine then went through a journey of its own genuine issues with safety that we then had to manage. But we didn't start out on a good foot. And I remember cautioning people to not throw shade on that vaccine. Not more, and I was accused of censorship. I don't want to censorship, censor people. And I think critical independent commentary is absolutely vital if we're to have good policy and good governance around risk. But at the same time, we need to get the balance right and be aware that an, an, an easy commentary about a vaccine not being good enough will undermine public willingness and confidence in that vaccine. And that will be a foundation of um, a difficult, more difficult foundation for us to manage concerns around vac the vaccine safety. And uh, so I think this is a very difficult one because I think there have been times when the commentary has come from the anxiety of the commentators, not necessarily with an awareness that that might be happening and that we don't have to sing from the same song sheet, but we do, as all of us, me included, need to be reflective of how our own experiences and feelings about the pandemic will affect the way we interpret risk, the way we bring in new information, and the way we talk with the public about what we think is important. If I can uh, just endorse what uh, Julie said, uh, relative risk and managing risk is very important. It's also really important to understand the limitations of uh, the material that's published. And we saw this with efficacy trials, which are uh, obviously related to trials themselves in phase three and then effectiveness studies which showed uh, quite a different pattern particularly in some of the best studies and this is where expertise is really important in understanding uh, the drawbacks of some of the literature that's published particularly on preprints which I think underpins what uh, Julie was talking about. Uh, I, we've often heard our chief health officers get up and, and give great information uh, and I think politicians uh, are not necessarily trusted by the, by the uh, public or journalists and we're often asked as a sort of a check on, on what's being said. So uh, I think it's uh, it's been very important to have uh, discussions and briefing sessions with the chief health officers, which have been wisely 
considered, which has led to, uh, if you like, some debate between the various experts and sometimes some of the stories which haven't been straight in some people's minds have been straightened up in that forum. So, uh, Tegan, it's not a matter of getting our, our story straight and challenging our integrity, but sometimes some people know more about things than others, and uh, particularly um, people like the TGA being able to tap into regulatory agencies all around the world and then brief us about what they know. Joan, I'm sure you have a view on this topic. Well, I, look, I mean, what's really interesting is evidence is now starting to come out about how publics actually have responded during the pandemic. So we, we, we fantasize about what publics are doing out there and sometimes we don't know. So just this morning, um, I, was, I was reading um, a really interesting new study coming out, uh, in, out of Germany um, around the power of self-correction. And so we're talking about speaking authentically uh, and, and what this study found was that um, when people had to walk back certain claims that they had made, or if someone is um, you know, maybe having a discussion in a public forum with disagreement, and they're able to kind of adjust as they go, um, you know, make reference to other evidence. I mean, this is incredibly powerful. And what we're seeing is that public audiences, I mean, are really responding to that in a way that maybe they haven't before. Um, and so I guess what I it's very easy to think what people think. <laughs> it's very easy to rush to that, but I actually think um, we're, we're now getting data, just, you know, the studies are um, trickling out now um, and they're telling us a really um, very complex story, I think, about what publics have made out of this. And, and that speaking authentically, being able to um, self-correct and not feel like that's going to um, uh, out you as somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about, having a little more confidence about that, um, I think I think should make uh, researchers feel a little bit um, a little bit more relaxed. Yeah. Um, look, before we go to an audience question, which we've got a couple sitting there, um, Tegan, I just wanted to follow up with you on some of these things. How how um, how much of a responsibility do you think lays lies with journalists to make sure that they've got the right expert on the topic that they're they're, they're writing about? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I don't think it's probably. I, I don't want to speak for all journalists, but I'm not sure that that's something that's given a lot of reflection because often in a news environment, I mean, everyone likes to talk about how fast paced news is and sometimes that's used as an excuse, which it shouldn't be, but it is a practical reality of working in the media is sometimes for better or worse, they're trying to, you're trying to talk to the person who can, you can talk to on that day. And depending on the medium, um, that could be, you might have the luxury of a bit more time to really find the right person who's going to bring that expertise. And you hope that that's the case most of the time. But I also, um, the Australian Science Media Centre, this isn't an ad, I promise, is such a fantastic resource for newsrooms because it helps bridge the gap between the scientific community and the journalistic community, which on the whole does not have a lot of existing scientific expertise. And there, I think there's sometimes a pretty big uh, health literacy gap often with journalists. And so organisations like OSSMC and as well as all the different other universities, institutions that help put that um, stuff out is good. And, I, and again, I wouldn't, I think there is a responsibility on journalists to, um, to have the right type of expert, but I'm not sure that was something that was given a lot of thought before about two years ago. And I definitely think that something that's been given a lot more thought now than it would have been before the pandemic. Can I just say, Susanna, on that topic, that one of the bright parts of the pandemic for me has, like I'd worked with the media before, but nothing like at this level in the last year and, and a half. And I'd actually done research on how journalists formulate pandemic stories during the avian influenza scare. And we'd published that. And I knew that having people available and who, who communicated clearly was very important and you needed to be able to go back to those people and check your facts. And so availability was essential. And working in partnership with journalists, because they're, most of the journalists I've worked with are very committed to getting the story as right as possible and balanced and reasonable and true as possible, um, has been fantastic and I used to be more scared of them than I am now 
but, you know, being able to chat with the producer and give them a bit of background to say, look, I think it's really important that we emphasise this and there's a bit of hysteria about that um, is, is helpful for journos, but also to bring them in contact with expertise is so important because they, as Tegan said, they are, it's often hard to find that expertise and they often don't know that, for example, an immunologist will have different expertise to a person who studies the epidemiology of vaccine programs. And then there are subtle differences, but they're important. And helping them access appropriate expertise for the topic can be essential. So that's the sort of deciding that you're not, you're going to stay in your lane here and you're not going into that topic because it's not your topic. But here's the person who you can talk to. And that's a vital function for journos who you know, need to work very quickly. Mm. Terrific. Look, we've got a, a really interesting question here from Jeremy Chapman. Um, he's asking, how should the traditionally slow scientific publish publishing process respond to the speed of the media cycle and the pandemic? And I, if I can just make a comment myself, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things that we've seen over this period has been the explosion in preprints, you know, that are not, not peer reviewed, um, but because we're so starved of information and needing information, we can't wait for them to be peer reviewed and published. And so that's obviously led to some really great things, but it's also led to some rather tricky things as well with papers being retracted after peer review and all sorts of things. Love to hear your views on this. Tony. Can I, can I, sorry, oh, can I really, quick, really quickly yeah. just to say, um, whatever, the, whatever the answer is to this, it's some sort of balance because you will never be able to publish peer-reviewed or otherwise fast enough for the hungry beast of the media and so I think in a way it would be great if things were faster but science also needs to be able to run its own race. Sorry Tony. No well I, I completely agree with uh, with Tegan and with uh, Jeremy in that uh, and Jeremy edits uh, a journal so he knows exactly what uh, what's involved and that is, we've seen this rise of preprints, which uh, in the early days of the uh, epidemic was uh, really uh, uh, created real problems. You know, chloroquine, uh, tocilizumab, um, uh, and even the, uh, the ivermectin stories have been, uh, it's fueled the, this alternative uh, um, dialogue, which uh, uh, has made life extremely difficult and uh, I think particularly in the USA has led to problems with uh, uh, vaccine uptake which uh, Julie can certainly comment on. Uh, I don't see the answer to that but I do see what Julie just said is really important and that is if you do choose experts uh, those experts can even email their colleagues overseas and uh, and get some of that information uh, firsthand. So uh, it is really important to have that full hand of experts in their field and certainly important that you don't um, go outside that but actually refer journalists to someone who really is plugged in. Right. Does, do either of the other panelists want to make a comment or should we move to the next question? Yeah, we'll move to the next question. Okay, here's another fascinating question from Warwick Anderson. Science seems to get less traction and less respect in social media. How might we remedy this? And um, this I find a really interesting question because um, one of the things that I've certainly noticed among um, people that I do know who are kind of more on the sceptical side of vaccines, if you like, um, and tend to follow, uh, let's say, conspiracy theories, you know, we all know people who have fallen prey to this kind of thing. On the whole, they don't trust the media. They're not necessarily following the, the mainstream media. They're following social media. And um, if we're not there, then we're not probably able to help them um, overcome uh, some of the, the, the misinformation that they're, they're receiving. Um, any thoughts on that from the panel? Joan. Look, I mean, I, I think it's a great question from Warwick, but um, nobody gets respect on social media, right? It's, it, you know, it's not just about science, right? I mean, oh, wow. I mean, you know, it's not the place you go for reason discourse. Um, and I think, and I think but I'm kind of being serious about that. I don't think that, you know, 
Twitter is going to be able to get cut through on these major complex stories. It's just, it just doesn't work that way. But I think you can, I mean, I think, and I, there's a lot of great examples, um, you're thinking about Deadly Science and other groups that have, you, they, they get in there and they really use social media to gain attention, to raise awareness, these kinds of, um, these kinds of things. And I think that's great. But conquering misinformation via social media, it's, it's almost like um, does not compute. <laughs> that's, that's just not what that channel is for. Um, so I guess, um, I guess my, my response to this would be, um, there's positive things you can do on social media, probably not about misinformation. That's not, or, or disinformation, see, because that's, that's also the goal, right, on a lot of social media, where you have very few people, these are loud, um, uh, but few in number, who get ample support for, from sometimes even state actors to confuse the situation. So if you're really interested in combating disinformation on social media, you've got to have a pretty well-resourced campaign, right? This is, this is kind of, you know, organized communication strategy. It's not one scientist kind of going out there to kind of correct what a group of people are saying. So I just think it's, it's a different form of mediation. And this is, again, what I was warning about, thinking about the media, because, this is a different thing. Yeah. So can I just ask you, uh, Joan, about Facebook uh, and um, the uh, issues it's had in terms of um, combating disinformation? Do you think that's uh, futile? Uh, I don't think that's futile if um, we can get a regulatory setting <laughs> uh, that allows us to, um, to actually um, have some kind of public input into what is legitimate information. And by public here, I would say the scientists are kind of the public trying to kind of um, encourage Facebook to um, uh, maybe uh, amplify uh, scientific views over others. But that, that's about regulation. And this is where you know, the scientific community, um, I think has been strangely kind of quiet um, and, and not gotten behind um, some of the other uh, pushes to regulate um, uh, actors like Facebook. The other thing I add to this is that we can't talk about the media without talking about social media anymore. The, so many Australians don't get their news from mainstream media sources. So if we're trying to talk to them, we have to be using social media as well. And it's really hard to communicate. It's the headline problem, right? Like the headline never really tells a full story. It's a completely the same thing on social media. Like the whole thing is just a headline. However, I do see some really interesting science communicators being really creative using places like TikTok and that sort of thing. That might be the only science communication that their audience members see. And so they, they're doing a really important work being in that space. Mm. Um, I've, I've got something to say on this as well. And, and I think I'm, I know Joan will uh, agree because you were talking about the, the publics before in, in communication, we talk, we call people publics because there's not just one homogenous public. Um, and in terms of this dilemma about how people are influenced by social media, it is very useful to be a bit um, scientific about this and to get evidence on how they are influenced. And you can ask people and they'll say, oh, you know, no, <laughs> you know, it's my doctor. Um, we know that how people say they're influenced is different to how they are influenced. But equally in all our research over two decades on vaccination decision-making, it's much more than a social media message that is going to change people's behaviour. And we need to remember that and put social media in context. Often it's about the source and often it's about the, or the receiver of the message and what sort of experiences, beliefs and values they bring to the message. And understanding the audiences, how the social media messages affect them in the context of their everyday lives, beliefs, um, experiences, is going to give us a much better foundation for responding than just having a lot of worry about misinformation or disinformation, which is clearly an issue, particularly at the moment, with certain communities with COVID. Um, but there is also an excellent science around de debunking uh, in, uh, from psychology in particular, where people you know, actually experiment on different methods of 
um, countering misinformation to see what's more effective. And um, we've we've looked at how you address vaccine myths, right, and whether you whether you rehearse the myth in order to counter it, or whether you pose a question or whether you just state the fact you want people to remember in the end, which is like vaccines are, um, they strengthen the immune system rather than myth, vaccines erode the immune system. And, uh, you know, you can, you can do science, a communication science around that and get answers. And in fact, it didn't actually matter. You can rehearse the myth up front and it didn't matter in our experiment. So, it's important to remember that. And also, if you go too much for censorship of social media platforms, there are risks around that as well. Um, you've got to have a good foundation for doing it. You've got to have knowledgeable fact checkers who have access to expertise and also not put the bar too low so that you censor things that should not be censored. Or in other countries, they take license as that being an excuse to limit freedom of expression for genuine critics. So all of those issues play into how we manage social media platforms. <coughs> yeah, great. Okay. Um, we have a question from Emily Banks, which is being voted up. I, I feel like you've, you've answered um, probably Emily's question, but I'll just... Um, say it anyway, she's asking what else can scientists do to reduce misinformation? So if anyone has a comment on what else we can do, anything more we can do. Um, well, just the, the, yeah, go on, Julie. Just, you know, this is a, a single PowerPoint slide in a lot of my talks, which is um, know how that misinformation, understand the misinformation, how it's affecting people's behaviour, how it's being, whether it's getting traction, because you don't want to debunk something that's not getting traction. Um, warn people, so actually psychologically prime them the, for the fact that they may hear vaccine, the COVID vaccine affects fertility. And here's why that's not correct. Here are the studies that, you know, followed people over time under IVF, et cetera, et cetera. So you give people a bit of detail. So they're primed and ready for the misinformation when they encounter it in the wild and they're less likely to accept it full and straight. And use trusted spokespeople. That's particularly important where you're trying to reach communities where there's less trust, there's maybe historical injustices, uh, and they will, they're obviously going to, it's a no-brainer, they're going to be more likely to listen to the debunking from people that they trust and respect. And social influence is quite strong. It's quite a strong influence when it comes to vaccination in particular. Right. I can just add the comment about trusted sources. And uh, I think this is why it's important to ensure that we do have our general practice uh, colleagues uh, are well involved in, uh, in any discussion about vaccines. Uh, uh, my experience is not just COVID, but uh, other vaccines as well. And also in Western Sydney, we have multi-ethnic communities and uh, the, the people in those communities are, are really very clear about who they trust and who they don't. And uh, I think we're probably uh, perhaps just a little bit late at times in, in actually getting to the trusted sources in some of those communities. Perhaps we've mm -hmm. learned from that. Yeah, right. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to take the next two questions together, or um, a couple of questions together. Um, so Warwick Anderson is actually questioning whether um, social media has really been that important in terms of the public's view on COVID generally. And then we have another question from, from an, uh, someone else just asking, why do you think there is a disproportionate focus on vaccine hesitancy in media reporting when actually it turns out that the Australian public is very willing to get vaxxed? Tegan, do you want to comment on that? Is it the conflict issue, the interest that the media has in conflict or in the other view? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I don't know about, I might let Joan or someone else answer about whether social media is as important as we think because I suspect from my own use that it is, but um, I haven't studied it. With the, with the adverse effects, I feel like the media is powered by human stories and anecdotes. And so that's a really big part of 
lots of different types of media coverage, not just health. And if you think about, you know, every time you've seen an angry person standing in front of a fence that wasn't fixed or their super's gone or whatever it is, this idea of a, a human story is very powerful. And I think that that might be part of what has driven this idea of hesitancy and, and wanting people to be informed. But then I think this idea of communicating risk is not done well on the whole in the media. Um, I'd like to think it's been done slightly better over time, but I think someone already said it, sometimes it comes a bit too late. It's come a bit too late in this pandemic. And I, I think it probably is sometimes this idea of falling into this trap of wanting to be representative or unbiased. And so, well, we've told you about the vaccines work and now we're telling you that sometimes they are, you know, they've, people have experienced harm or, or think that they've experienced harm from them, but the weight of those two things aren't presented equally or aren't received equally by the audience necessarily. You hear like someone saying, oh, we did a trial and like a bazillion people and they were all fine, but this one person wasn't. So for some reason, um, the behavioural scientists in the room will be able to explain better than me. That one human story is, is often the thing that sticks in your mind, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Joan and Julie, do you want to comment on how important social media actually is? I'll start, and I'm, I, I imagine Julie will <laughs> can finish. Um, look, I mean, it's a fabulous question. I mean, and we want we don't want to just know this for COVID. We want to know this for politics, and we want to know it for all kinds of other impacts that social media might have. I think um, the data is really strange because, on the one hand, there are really big um, studies with you know, big data studies looking at the way, for example, tweets go global around the world. Um, and so what we know is that yes, um, things get shared. We can talk about that. We can talk about the big story, the big population level, if you will, um, results. And so looking at those, I would say, um, well, my goodness, there's a lot of people spending a lot of time and a lot of effort sharing a lot of information. We know information bubbles are real. Uh, and so they're sharing information. And so from that, we might infer and extrapolate that, yes, social media has um, an impact on people because they're consuming so much of it. But then Julie had already mentioned that, you know, however, when you get down to it and you start asking people <laughs> about how their day to day consumption um, impacts their behavior, you get very different stories. Um, and I don't think those that research has yet is yet clear. Um, and, and so I think you, know, you look at some papers that say, oh, within one community, um, you know, uh, teenage girls change their behavior toward dietary restriction because of this kind of sharing within their information bubble. Well, okay, that looks like it has impact, but then you go ask another community and you can't, you can't show that impact. So those, those really, um, what I would call intimate <laughs> kinds of research, the really difficult, I think, kinds of research where you're looking at actually what people do um, I think that's a little bit more inconclusive. So that's how I, I so more research is needed. How's that? <laughs> yeah, I really agree with that, Joan. Uh, we, ironically, we don't really know, and it's not easy to study how social media messages affect people's behaviour. A colleague of mine, Adam, Adam Dunn at Sydney University, has been doing a lot of network science around how um, sentiment uh, exposure in social media on Twitter um, correlates with low vaccine uptake for HPV. And he's done it in Australia and the US, um, this research, showing a correlation. Uh, but we don't know what comes first. Like, we don't know whether it's what they call homophily or contagion. It's just like talk to like, and they happen to also, you know, be less likely to vaccinate, or whether um, lot of people are influencing each other and causing the lower vaccination. And I think it's both actually, <laughs> you know, it's complicated like on Facebook, but in terms of hesitancy, and thank you for the person who asked that question. Um, uh, this is a real passion of mine, actually. Uh, uh, why, why is hesitancy blamed for all low vaccine uptake? Um, four reasons, WHO, language, um, agency and politics. So WHO declared hesitancy to be one of the top 10 threats to public health in 2019. And it is a very challenging thing to deal with. And it has had major impacts on vaccine programs in some countries at points in time. 
but you also have this ongoing problem of people not being able to easily access services, having vaccine supply issues, including for child vaccines in certain countries. And we've now lived that. So people get that problem a lot more because they've lived the, I want to have the COVID vaccine yet, I can't get it easily, or I can't book it, or I can't help my elderly aunt book it. So it's, it's WHO made that declaration. Um, and I think that put a lot of focus on hesitancy and it gave us a word to describe the problem of low vaccine uptake. That's just a lot easier to put in headlines, but also it implies agency. It's easier to understand and put a narrative around those naughty people who refuse to listen to the science and refuse vaccination than it is to put a narrative around the single mum um, with three children in Burke, no transport, who can't get an appointment with the GP. Um, and we're not so good at talking about the social determinants of health because they're systemic problems rather than individual problems. And that also leads into the politics where politicians, if their program is failing partly or a lot because they haven't put in or consulted in the way they should or prepared in the way they should, it's much easier to blame people's hesitancy than to take responsibility for your failure to set up good program delivery. And we've seen just how much in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT, how high the coverage can be how, and how quickly that can happen when governments are very motivated to bring the vaccines to the people. And um, we still need to do that in other states as well. So uh, I just want to add one thing, and that is implicit in the question is that the, the, there hasn't been a problem, but uh, there have been surveys, and Julie may want to comment, Nicholas Biddle's one from a new comes to mind, uh, comparing intent to be uh, immunised uh, earlier this year compared to three to four months later. Uh, and, the, uh, and there's been an enormous shift in, in that intent. Okay, good. Well, look, um, we've just got a few minutes left. Uh, I'm going to combine the, the uh, next two questions from Warwick Anderson and Louise Bohr. Um, so Warwick is asking how should our academy maximise its impact in the media? And Louise is asking what can we learn from COVID and the media experiences for communications about not so acutely deadly, but also very high burden and somewhat neglected and, uh, NCDs. Um, so, you know, I guess if we think of this in terms of, you know, what have we learned and how can we um, use that to uh, communicate more effectively in the future and also maximise the academy's impact in this space. Anyone in the panel like to grab hold of that one? Uh, the, the only thing I'd make is that I think uh, journalists do come through large institutions. Uh, University of Sydney and others to uh, seek uh, expertise and uh, certainly the Academy could offer uh, to also be uh, a reservoir of expertise and uh, I think uh, our university puts these things, uh, uh, they've got a reservoir of this within their uh, media communications uh, centres. So anyone yeah, have a practical, a, sorry, sorry, practical perspective, that's a really good way. I think often um, if you don't have a specific beat as a journalist, you're often sort of assigned a story and told to go out and find the right person to speak to it. And it's much simpler to do that if you're going through an institution and to be able to go through something like somewhere like the Academy would be a fantastic resource. You're actually wanting to get advice on who might be the best person. We were talking before about the responsibility to have the right voices speaking. Uh, and the other thing I would say at an individual level is to, if you if you want to speak to the media, and I don't know if it's self-evident that you must or that you're obligated to, and I know that that's been canvassed in other sessions, uh, that you build relationships with reporters that you trust and that it can be symbiotic. So you might be coming to them with an idea of something that you'd like to sort of see spoken about or reported on, and likewise they might come to you for comment or advice on, um, on who they should speak to or sort of a sense check on things. Um, and those relationships, I think, can end up being really fruitful because there's trust there. It's not quite so transactional. And, um, and I think that that is 
probably the sort of relationships that lead to better reporting of science in the media. Can I endorse that uh, entirely, Tegan? Uh, it's really important to choose who you're uh, speaking to. There are uh, some uh, commentators who, in essence, will use you as an Aunt Sally. Um, I think uh, once I was uh, perhaps foolish enough to talk to Byron Bay FM, but the person concerned was an excellent journalist. However, he did end up by saying, uh, Professor Cunningham, can you assure my listeners that you're not part of the worldwide uh, uh, global pharmaceutical conspiracy? But uh, he did have his tongue in his cheek, uh, I must say. Great. Well, we're almost up for time. I might just um, ask one final question. And this is actually a really meaty topic. We won't have time to go into it in a lot of detail. So I thought perhaps if I could just hear from Julie and Tony about this one. Um, and Tegan and Joan, please feel free to jump in if you have a strong feeling about it. But, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the impact of scientists in the media. But the other issue, of course, that we've heard a bit about lately is the impact of the media on scientists. And a survey that we did with uh, Nature just recently showed that scientists are exposed to some horrific uh, harassment after doing media. Um, one could say that, you know, that's just, you just got to roll with the punches and it's the responsibility of experts to communicate with the media and the public in times of crisis, but it's at enormous personal cost. Um, Julie and Tony, do you have a comment on this? I've been dealing with this for years because I've been commenting about vaccination in the media for years. And the, the, the heart, and I, you know, I had like a, a mild death threat, I suppose, recently, and some abuse and, and vile abuse, but my colleagues have had a lot worse and that's upsetting as well. People have been very upset to hear that this is happening. So we've got the weight of the community on side who are grateful that we're bringing science to them. Um, I've written a blog about this on my blog, Human Factors, on how to deal with social media harassment. Um, I think it happens to professional women quite a bit who are out there with controversial topics, but men as well. And it also um, is something that you need to manage well, but it does have a silencing effect. There's no, there's no doubt that um, abuse and harassment through social media in particular, or directly through email has an, a negative effect. However, like when we're in anything in public health, we're weighing up risks and benefits. It is a risk, you need to manage it. Institutions need to help scientists manage it. We need to build confidence in other people to be media commentators and manage it. Um, but we also, the benefits of engagement are so vast that they far outweigh these risks and we need to keep being out there and supporting each other. Terrific, thank you, Julian. 30 seconds, Tony. Yeah, well, I completely agree. Um, uh, I'll just read you very briefly what uh, one of my colleagues uh, uh, encountered in his email. The anger in society about corruption of the medical profession and its collusion with the pharmaceutical industry is at boiling point. I predict eventually collaborators like you will be targeted. I hope you'll choose to get on board with the truth rather than be a well-paid liar the biowarfare genocide is pretending to be pharmacists just goes to show the degree of anger uh, that's generated in in some people and certainly leading to death threats and I completely endorse what Julie says uh, we certainly are blocking any emails to me that uh, are uh, mildly threatening from then on. Fantastic Thank you so much and thank you very much to all of our panelists. If we were in the room we'd all be clapping. And my, <laughs> I've been so still that my lights have gone off. <laughs> uh, so thank you again to Tony, Tegan, Joan and Julie. And now it's back to you, Kieran. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you for chairing that very thought provoking and certainly just at that last bit in particular sobering session. Um, thank you again to our panelists, to Joan, to Julie, to T and Tony. And thank you as well to those in the audience, those who made comments and asked questions throughout that session. That was great.